Star Trek TNG, USS Enterprise had a normal operating speed of warp 6. Warp 1 is the speed of light. Warp 6 is about 400 times the speed of light. And that's not the limit. Sometimes the ship moved at speeds thousands of times the speed of light. Some people would say, but no physical object with non-zero mass can accelerate to the speed of light. Other people who are familiar with the concept of the warp drive would say that here the ship itself is not moving at such speeds. And the third group of people would say, Hey, it's fiction. We don't argue about the realism of magic in Harry Potter. Well, most of us don't. And still, there is word science in science fiction. Very often, it uses some actual physical principles, laws and describes technologies that are possible, at least in principle, even if they don't exist yet. But the word fiction is also there. A topic of a drive that uses the concept of warping space-time is pretty popular. Perhaps many of you have heard that it is possible, at least in principle, and we could use it to effectively travel faster than light by warping space-time. You might have even heard that NASA was working on a warp drive. What? So when are we finally going to build the first working warp drive prototype? After I made a video on M-Drive, I decided to make another video on a different type of a hypothetical drive. So let's talk about the history of warp drive. Is it actually possible and could we use it to explore the galaxy? Also, I will touch on the problems of the hypothetical technology. And have there been any real experiments with the concept of warp drive? And also we will talk about some recent studies. And my name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. Most of you are probably well aware of one of the biggest issues of interstellar travel. We are pretty slow. Using existing engines, it would take us tens of thousands of years to reach even the nearest star to the Sun, Proxima Centauri. Even now, there are some concepts that would allow us to travel at a significant fraction of the speed of light and that don't violate laws of physics and could be done in principle. Even that wouldn't be that fast. And of course, speed is not the only problem of interstellar travel. There is a lot more to it. Anyway, if we want humanity to become a galactic civilization that is able to travel from one star to another, in short time spans we need FTL, or faster than light travel. And of course, the problem is that no physical object with non-zero mass can accelerate to the speed of light in a vacuum. Again, you've probably heard at least a couple of explanations of why it is the case. For instance, the explanation that according to the theory of special relativity, the faster object is moving, the more massive it becomes. So as the velocity relative to an observer approaches the speed of light, the mass also approaches infinity. And to actually achieve it, you would need infinite energy, which is a problem. But that is not the problem for photons that are massless. A different explanation involves time. Again, according to Einstein, space and time are intertwined and we constantly move not only through space but also through time. And we move through time at the speed of light. So this is a simplified graph with a single spatial dimension. But it demonstrates that the faster we move through space, the slower we move through time. And if we were to accelerate to the speed of light, the time would stop. There are a lot of good videos and articles on that topic. The important thing for us here is that the barrier of the speed of light is still considered to be unbreakable. But so far, I've been talking about accelerating to the speed of light, but we want to move even faster. A tiny little thing that if faster than light travel was possible, it could allow us to travel back in time, which would violate causality, but that's a conversation for another time. Even if we forget about needed energy source, interstellar dust and other issues, at the most basic level, it is considered to be impossible. You cannot just hop into a spaceship and accelerate it to the speed of light. But we also have a couple of loopholes and they involve the fabric of space-time itself. Firstly, it's wormholes or Einstein-Rosen bridges. The theoretical possibility of the existence of such things is inferred from the equations of general relativity, which doesn't mean that they really exist. And yet, if we could create a traversable wormhole, a tunnel between two points of space-time, it would allow us to travel between those two points effectively faster than light. We don't actually move faster than light, we just take a shortcut. And the second loophole is warp drive. In popular description of warp drives, the spaceship itself doesn't move at such speeds, but the warp bubble around it does. If there is a limit for physical objects moving through space, the space-time itself basically doesn't have that limit. But I'll get back to that. 
Where did the idea of warp drive first appear? As it usually goes, first it appeared in science fiction, where it for a long time has been one of the most popular means of interstellar travel. And of course, Star Trek popularized the concept, but definitely was not the first to use it. There is some confusion. Many sources claim that warp drives were first described in John Campbell's Islands of Space. It was published as a separate novel in 1957. But actually it goes back all the way to 1931 when it appeared in Amazing Stories. I found an archived version of this magazine and the plot actually involves interstellar travel, though the word warp is never used there. But there is, quote, straining of space, unquote. In 1948, in an issue of Amazing Stories, there was a short story by Chester Gere that described war generators, warping of space, though this already looks a lot like a familiar description of a warp drive way before Star Trek. I'll leave links to both magazines so you can read them yourselves. But serious scientific discussion began much later. And there comes a physicist and Star Trek fan, Miguel Alcubierre. No article or a video on a warp drive can avoid his name. He created the first mathematical model in the framework of general relativity that described the theoretical possibility of using warping of space-time to effectively move faster than light. This obviously doesn't mean that it's a ready-to-use recipe for creating an actual warp drive, and even that it would ever be possible to make it. But that's at least an attempt to describe a warp drive with the language of actual science. I've watched some lectures of Miguel Alcubierre, and here is what I found to be interesting. In some ways, the topic of this video is similar to my previous video on M drive. In both videos, I talk about interstellar travel and hypothetical drives. But if Roger Scheuer, the inventor of M drive, insisted that his technology worked in spite of it apparently violating laws of physics, and to this day argues with those who oppose him and who, using high-precision measurements, prove that M-Drive does not in fact create any thrust. Alcubierre never claimed that the warp drive could actually be created. It's quite the opposite. He openly discusses problems of warp drive in his articles. Another similarity of two stories is that in both cases, NASA's Eagle Works laboratory was involved and it conducted some experiments. But again, Schroer made a big deal of supposedly positive results of Eagle Works' tests, which later were debunked. Alcubierre instead, commenting on the experiments, said that he wasn't even sure that they knew what they were doing. I'll get back to the experiments. So what's the basic principle of the Alcubierre drive? Let's address the origin source. Alcubierre's original study from 1994. An abstract is short, so I'll just read it. It is shown how within the framework of general relativity and without the introduction of wormholes, it is possible to modify a space-time in a way that allows a spaceship to travel with an arbitrarily large speed, by a purely local expansion of space-time behind the spaceship and an opposite contraction in front of it. Motion faster than the speed of light, as seen by observers outside the disturbed region, is possible. The resulting distortion is reminiscent of the warp drive of science fiction. However, just as it happens with wormholes, exotic matter will be needed in order to generate a distortion of space-time like the one discussed here. So, there are things that should be discussed in more detail. This is basically what usually is described in sci-fi, but the article puts it in a framework of general relativity. Concerning warping of space-time. According to Albert Einstein, space is not just emptiness, as it is the case in classical Newtonian mechanics. The fabric of space-time itself reacts to the presence of mass, which we call gravity. That has been proven in experiments and with observations multiple times. Another point is that space-time is expanding, and the expansion is accelerating. Alcubierre writes that the way space-time may behave with warp drives is somewhat analogous to the expansion of the universe and inflation period. But how come a warp bubble is supposed to be able to move faster than the speed of light? Well, no physical object can accelerate to the speed of light, but the space-time itself can stretch and expand faster than light all at once. The universe is expanding, and the farther the galaxy is from us, the faster it recedes. Right now, in the universe, there are galaxies that are moving away from us faster than light. Not because they are physically moving for space at such velocities at their local coordinates. No, in their galactic neighborhood they are moving relatively slowly. But because two points in the fabric of space-time are receding from one another faster than the speed of light, which is allowed by laws of physics. With warp drives it is somewhat similar, but you need to create a local deformation of space-time. 
Alcubierre writes that by contracting spacetime in front of a ship and expanding it behind it, the spaceship in a bubble with flat local space could move faster than light. In a way, it is reminiscent of a conveyor belt. And the spaceship may not even experience time dilation. All right, still this doesn't look very different from what is usually described in sci-fi. What did Miguel Alcubierre actually do? So we've got a concept of a drive that warps space-time. In general relativity, space is warped by mass. How much mass energy we would need to create a bubble for warp drive to work? Usually it goes like this. Let's say we have a star. We know its mass, it is put in Einstein's equations and we can figure out how the star should curve space-time. That's in short. But Alcubierre did it the other way around. At first he described the geometry of space-time, and only then basically solved the equations backwards to find out what mass energy you would need to create such a geometry. So what was the result of that? Well, first the concentration of mass energy has to be really, really big. But that's not the main issue. The main issue is that it has to be negative. What? I'm talking about both mass and energy because of their equivalence, but let's focus on mass as the example. What is negative mass? Don't confuse it with antimatter, which I recently made a video about. Antimatter particles have opposite charge or in some cases other properties, but mass is always positive. It is the same as saying that the mass of an object is minus 10 kilograms. That doesn't sound very intuitive. Here is an object with positive mass, and here is with negative. Such an object would have a really weird behavior. If you pushed an object, it would instead accelerate towards you. The biggest issue of negative mass is that, basically, no one has seen it yet. Someone may remember headlines from 2017 that claimed that scientists created negative mass in a lab. But actually they didn't. They cooled down rubidium atoms to almost absolute zero and, in the state of Bose-Einstein condensate, they only behaved like negative mass. Still, the existence of negative mass is not against laws of physics. This is not as controversial as M-drive. Also, the existence of negative energy is allowed by quantum field theory under certain conditions. Some of you may also remember the Casimir effect. By the way, that's the ring of negative mass. So it's not completely impossible. But I've mentioned something about needing a lot of mass. The earliest estimates had some crazy number. To create a warp bubble for a small spacecraft, you would need a mass of 10 times mass of the entire observable universe. Doesn't seem very viable. But later, more scientists became interested in the topic and more studies came out with different calculations. Scientists made changes to the geometry of Alcubierre bubble and that allowed to lower the amount of needed mass. In this study from 1999, it is only a few solar masses of negative mass and the same amount of regular mass. Well, that's not 10 universes, but it is still not clear how all of that stuff in a small space would not collapse into a black hole. But later, estimates were lowered even more. The calculations of Harald White from Eagleworks by changing the bubble geometry brought the required mass down to mass of Voyager 1 spacecraft. That sounds much more reasonable. But there is still a question of where to get even this much of exotic matter with negative mass. By the way, as we are talking again about Eagleworks, I mentioned some experiments. At some point you could see headlines in the media that claimed that NASA began working on warp drive. Obviously no one was building warp drives, but some experiments did take place. Harold White's team used laser interferometers and tried to detect the warp field. Obviously they couldn't have negative mass, so instead they used static electric field to attempt to create a microscopic bubble of warp spacetime. Laser beam weighed through a region where the warp field was supposed to be created and detectors measured if its pathway was altered. It is kind of similar to how large gravitational wave detectors like LIGO and Virgo work, but on a smaller scale. Eagleworks team used various methods and different interferometers to try to exclude false positive signals. Also, they used seismic protection from outside vibrations and they managed to detect some kind of a signal. But even White said that it was not a definitive detection of a warp field. And there were other studies that claimed that Eagleworks' system in principle couldn't have detected warp field even if it was generated. There is another interesting problem. By the way, the Alcubierre bubble doesn't necessarily have to travel faster than light. It could be subluminal. 
but if it was super luminal, there would be a problem of the horizon. Inside such a bubble, a pilot would be cut off from the rest of the universe. The bubble acts similarly to the event horizon of a black hole. This means that a pilot has no way of controlling the bubble and someone has to do it from the outside, which is not very convenient. And those, of course, are not all of the issues. We don't know if people and even the spacecraft could actually survive inside the bubble. And can the bubble damage anything outside of it? And what if it actually leads to creating the time machine with all of its paradoxes? Currently, warp drive still looks like something from science fiction. Not impossible, but with a lot of problems to solve. But recently, perhaps it became a tiny bit more realistic. This year, two studies came out where scientists apparently managed to get rid of the main problem – need for negative mass. The first study by Alexei Bobrik and Gianni Martiri is called Introducing Physical Warp Drives. Which means that when warp drives still needed negative mass, by many they were not considered to be physical. The authors also worked with Einstein's equations and they modified the geometry of a bubble. They created a model where a warp bubble could be created with regular mass. Create a massive compact shell that still has to be about the mass of a planet, but at least it is possible theoretically. Another caveat is that here we would still need to use some classical engine. And perhaps the most notable thing is that in these solutions it wouldn't be possible to travel faster than light. Anyway, they conclude that a technology that we would call a warp drive could be created based on principles that are known today. Subluminal, yes, but a warp drive. If it could reach a significant fraction of the speed of light, it is still better than nothing. But there is another recent article by Eric Lenz. He managed to create solutions that still require huge amounts of mass, but regular mass. His solutions have some geometry of warped spacetime with shapes like these and a complicated layer structure made of a super dense fluid material. Perhaps similar to what you would find inside a neutron star. Easy. Take a neutron star, crack it open, pour some stuff out of it, and build a drive. Well, that's not how a neutron star would work, but still, at least Lance's solution allow faster than light travel. Most importantly, both studies managed to get rid of negative mass energy and that made some people a bit more enthusiastic. Obviously, that doesn't mean that soon we are going to begin building a warp drive, perhaps not even in several hundred years. Of course, there is a lot more here I didn't have time to talk about. But at least now we can tell that warp drive has become a little less impossible. Obviously, warp drive is still far from becoming a reality, but at least there is some possibility that one day, perhaps in 500 or 1000 years, it may be created. Or not. Who knows. After all, we don't seem to be constantly visited by aliens that are riding their fancy warp drives. But with the new data, there is at least some tiny little reason for optimism. Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are as usual down in the description. And if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Bye.